So when you think about the biggest, bloodiest wars of pre-modern times, there's a lot that comes to mind. There's the Second Punic War where Hannibal ravaged Rome for over a decade. You have the fall of the Ming uh, in the establishment of the Qing Dynasty, which was a very long and horrendous process. You had the Byzantine Sassanid War that went on, I think, for like 20 years and accomplished absolutely nothing. And then you have the Thirty Years' War, which has got to be one of the most confusing, strange, elongated conflicts in history. I'm going to apologize up front. I might make some mistakes when I'm doing this, and I might not be super clear. That's not necessarily my fault per se. That's just because this whole thing is is a, is a mess, and that's why it went on so long. That's why it's the Thirty Years' War and not the Five Years' War or the Seven Years' War or the, the One Year War. It had a number of phases. The phases weren't mutually exclusive. The maps are also not going to be the best because there's not really a good map because things change so much, so often over the course of the war because you can't really do it Catholic versus Protestant because Catholic countries like France were on the side of the Protestants and I think some Protestant states were on the side of the emperor. So it was, wasn't like a split thing, and then there's, there's multiple factions. We'll, go, we'll all get into that nonsense in a minute. So the 17th century is often called the general crisis, and it's considered one of the worst times to have been alive. I believe this is when, yeah, this is when the fall of the Ming dynasty happened. Uh, there was some rather dramatic changes in Europe uh, in terms of climate, that caused a lot of famine. It got a lot colder. Crops were worse. Uh, people were colder. They they hadn't really had houses designed for the temperatures that they were now having to face. There's also just the problems with the early modernity. See, traditionally, a lot of things were provided for by the aristocrats or the gentry. Under feudalism, they held a fief. And in return for that, they tended to provide things like, in combination with the church, services, uh, military service, things like schools, health care, infrastructure. Those sorts of things were largely handled by nobility in the church, and they held lands to that effect. Over time, you saw a, gradually, a gradual offloading of these responsibilities onto the central government uh, there's a number of reasons for this better communication. Also, just the nature of things like cannons meant that you needed much larger war chests to deal with things. Fetal levies just weren't really cutting it anymore. So you had this scenario in which the monarchies were having to pick up the tab for all this stuff that the nobility and church used to do. Also, post-Reformation, and a lot of the land was uh, secularized, but they weren't given new revenue streams. So they had basically the same crown demands as they had prior to these, the offloading of these responsibilities and no new taxes were raised, but nobles still held their lands. So their, expensive mass, their expenses massively increased while their income stayed the same, which resulted in immense debt from the various crowns and massive levels of corruption as they had to start selling off uh, crown land or selling off noble titles or stuff like that. It just became a, a total mess. Everyone was financially insolvent. When you look at the geopolitical situation, the Reformation had never really been resolved, I think you can argue. Charles V had crushed the Schmerkaldic League. Schmerkaldic League? I can't pronounce it. Had crushed it and prevented Protestantism from becoming the dominant religion within the empire but it was still a major force. And while there was a certain degree of peace and detente between the Lutherans and Catholics, once Calvinism showed up, that threw a whole monkey wrench into it. Because the Calvinists were extremely violent, and they attacked both Lutherans and Catholics, and they burned churches, and they desecrated the sacrament, and they were basically running wild, and that really re-inflamed a lot of the tensions. The Habsburgs were also in the position where, kind of like the Papal States in Italy, they were the strongest power within the Holy Roman Empire, but they weren't dominant. 
a coalition of other states could and did oppose them and their control waxed and waned. Another issue is that Habsburg lands aren't contiguous. They had fiefdoms and states that they controlled all across the Holy Roman Empire. Obviously, they had Austria, Bohemia, and Hungary, which were kind of the nucleus, but they had all this other stuff that they had to manage. There's also the issue of Habsburg still ruled Spain, even though Spain and Austria had been separated with the Charles, uh, the death of Charles V, you still had these two superpowers that were both controlled by the same dynasty and both shared the same interests. You also had France, which was getting past the extreme decentralization it had in the past, and it was an emerging great power, and it kind of wanted its place in the sun. There's also the issue that Spain was surrounded on all sides by opponents. You have England to the west, you have the, um, uh, what was it, the Spanish Netherlands to the north. You have the Holy Roman Empire to the east, and you have Spain to the south. France is basically surrounded on all sides by powerful enemies that are allied with each other. And if it wants to, I guess, be viable in the long term or become a dominant European power, it's going to have to do something to bring its various opponents down. And that brings us to the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, my friend Torellian told me that someone tried to codify the laws and rules of the Holy Roman Empire, and they made it to a hundred volumes before they gave up. It's extremely difficult to explain how it worked, because it was this weird kind of organic state that developed over time that was different from pretty much anywhere else in the world. And... It was kind of this weird mixture of legalism and expediency. Honestly, when I was reading the book, what really came across is kind of, it reminded me a bit of modern American politics where people talk about the Constitution. They go, my Constitution, my rights. We have to follow proper parliamentary procedure. But then when it gets at all inconvenient, they immediately jettison the Constitution and it goes back to every man for himself. Grab what you can. So essentially, the whole Holy Roman Empire was led by the emperor, who for the last couple generations had been a Habsburg of the House of, uh, of well, of Austria. And theoretically, at least, it was an elective monarchy, but it's it's a bit more complicated than that. So maybe just to try to give you an idea of how complicated this is. So... The whole, so it's, there's the Holy Roman Empire, and then there's the Kingdom of Germany, which is like 80% of the Holy Roman Empire. And then it's sometimes called the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And the Holy Roman Emperor is also the King of Germany, which it's Germany's like 80% of it. Um, this is past the time where the Italian states were part of the Holy Roman Empire, and it had become pretty German. Then we get like scenarios where you have Hungary and Bohemia, which are part of the Holy Roman Empire, but are not part of the Kingdom of Germany. So they're, they're direct vassals or direct territories owned by the Habsburgs, but they're not part of Germany. But Bohemia, despite not being part of Germany, still gets to vote within the Electoral College. You follow that? No, nobody else really could at the time either. Uh, you had like hundreds and hundreds of states within the Holy Roman Empire. Some of the countries continued to um, practice gavel kind in which they would distribute, uh, a, a lord would distribute their territory to their sons. So you'd sometimes have a case where a relatively small principality would divide into four more principalities and then they'd keep dividing. And you had all of these different sizes within it. So you had some states that were kind of middle powers. Uh, so you had like Saxony, uh, Brandenburg, the Palatinate, who were relatively powerful states. Then you had Bavaria, which was a power, perhaps even a great power on its own. And then you had Austria, which was basically a superpower. And to a certain extent, there is a certain degree of theoretical equality between them and a theoretical kind of equality between the electors, even though the electors were just not, because some of them were really small, some of them were medium-sized. 
I believe Austria was not an elector and Bavaria wasn't. And that was one of the causes of the Thirty Years' War. But it's weird that the two strongest countries by far within the Holy Roman Empire didn't have a vote as to who was emperor. So kind of to maybe give a bit more background, the whole kind of mess started, well, this this phase of the mess started when Charles V inherited uh, Spain and Germany, and then obviously Naples and some other various holdings. And Protestantism broke out with the emergence of Martin Luther. Now, Charles V was against Protestantism, but for most of his reign, he was busy dealing with other stuff, like dealing with France, dealing with the Turks, dealing with revolts in Italy. So they kept delaying dealing with Protestantism. So it kept spreading within the empire, and he kept granting edicts of toleration. The idea that he had was in the long term, they would call an ecumenical council which eventually became the Council of Trent, that would resolve all the existing problems. Obviously, the Council of Trent did not resolve all existing problems, although it and the Counter-Reformation allowed Catholics to reclaim at least their dominant position within the Holy Roman Empire. The Schmeldic League, which I'm probably mispronouncing horribly, tried to rise up to fight Charles V, but he beat them, However, he was never able to completely destroy Protestantism. And then you had the Peace of Augsburg, which these things are all very ambiguous. From my understanding, it allowed princes within the Holy Roman Empire to choose to be either Lutheran or Catholic. Calvinism was explicitly excluded. Both Ruth Lutherans and Catholics despised Calvinists for a variety of different reasons. Um, it depends on the subsect of Lutheranism. See, one of the things that made the whole thing so bizarre was Martin Luther initially started out as being a Catholic reformer. He initially didn't really have that much in the way of theological stuff. It was about reforming church abuses. It was about uh, putting more things under the control of Germany and less governance from the Latins in Italy. That sort of thing. And to go back maybe a little further, the result of the Black Death had been there had been a massive killing off of the clergy. Uh, not just a killing off of the clergy, but the good clergy. Uh, the good clergy who tried to tend to their flocks while the Black Death was going on, they tended to die. And the corrupt ones or the ones who didn't really care about their job tended to survive. They also, the church came up with this situation where we'll just say like 50, 60 percent of the priests who had died over the span of a couple decades. So they just had to rush through anyone they could get. There was very little training. Uh, I think simony was widely practiced where they'd sell church offices. They weren't really getting the cream of the crop and the people they were getting were particularly well educated and the papacy was doing some seedy practices to try to get money during this period. As I said earlier, everyone was in a constant state of financial crisis. So my point is when Luther initially came forward, he had a lot of sympathy. Even Charles V was somewhat sympathetic to him because they're like, yeah, we, we need church reform. We need all this stuff to happen. So long as Luther doesn't talk about reforming things like the sacraments or fundamental changes we can get behind it and there was a lot of sympathy for him and then luther who i i believe had severe untreated bipolar because there's no reason to do it kind of became a megalomaniac and started adding all this other stuff in and then you had another type of counter-revolution where you had melanchon come in and he got rid of some of the crazier stuff luther did and so you had like high church and low church Lutherans, and it was just kind of a mess. And none of that really got resolved on time because Charles V was doing other stuff. And the Pope snaked on him, and the Pope refused to call a council because he was afraid it would be dominated by Germans. The point being that the, the religious issues were somewhat stable, they were simmering, but when you started to throw Calvinists into it is when everything kind of went nuts. 
So I guess that's kind of some of the background. Um, now let's go ahead a bit into what actually started the Thirty Years' War. So the Holy Roman Empire, theoretically at least, was an elective monarchy. Depending on the time period, at the time of the uh, Thirty Years' War, you had seven electors. Uh, three spiritual, who were archbishops that controlled large territories, and four secular ones. So kind of one of the things that started this is Ferdinand II came to power, who was a very devoted Catholic and a very, he very much wanted to reform the empire. Because I, I didn't really go into detail about it, cause it's not even like really possible to explain it in like one video. But there was the Diet and all the different members of the Empire got votes, but the electors got special votes. But there was all these carve outs and exemptions and the Emperor had to go through different courts. And it was just this bureaucratic, legalistic mess. And Ferdinand really wanted to resolve the religion question and also... Try to, maybe this is a massive oversimplification, but try to make Germany into kind of a coherent nation state, at least somewhat. At least make it more, make himself the actual king of Germany, even if it stayed relatively decentralized. Kind of end this thing where Austria was kind of its own thing. It's, I'm sorry if I'm not being very clear. The whole thing is just immensely complicated and not particularly interesting. If you want to go read about how the Holy Roman Empire actually functioned, uh, go ahead. But it, it's, it was a mess. So if we look at the electors, the three spiritual electors were pretty much always Catholic and were Catholic at the time of the Thirty Years' War. Then we get to the secular electors and that gets more interesting. So let's look at the religious affiliation of, of the different ones. Okay, so Saxony at this time period was Protestant. Uh, the Palatine at this period was Protestant. I'm counting Calvinist and Lutheran. Uh, the Elector of Bohemia we'll get to in a minute. And then we have the Elector of Brandenburg, who was Protestant. So of the seven uh, electors at the moment, we have three of them are Protestant and four of them are Catholic. And that brings us to the Elector of Bohemia, which was controlled by the Archduke of Austria. Now, Bohemia was theoretically an elective monarchy. It's just the Habsburgs were the de facto heirs, so they would just keep getting elected. However, Bohemia was largely Protestant, even though the votes in it went to Catholic monarchs. So what the Protestants were thinking is, if we can flip just one more elector, then once Ferdinand dies, we can elect a Protestant emperor. And then the empire will become much more favorable, if not explicitly Protestant. And this led to the Bohemian Revolt. So Frederick of the Palatine, which was a Protestant elector, got himself elected king of Bohemia and claimed that electoral spot. Now, Bohemia was one of the wealthiest provinces within the empire, and because it was directly owned by the Habsburgs, they got all the money from it, and it basically funded all their operations elsewhere. So by becoming king of Bohemia, that took away not only the electoral spot and gave Protestants a majority, but it also took away the main source of income. So the Habsburgs, in alliance with a number of Catholic princes uh, led by Bavaria, supported the Habsburgs, and they went in and crushed the, um, the Bohemian Revolt, and Bohemia was returned to its previous position. Now, as a punishment for revolting against the emperor, the uh, Ferdinand took away the electoral status and most of the territory of Frederick, now, Frederick was really stupid because he probably could have saved most of his land and his title as elector if he had have just, like, thrown himself on the mercy of the emperor. But he chose to flee to Brandenburg and eventually ask for help from Sweden. Now, Ferdinand took this opportunity to completely devastate the existing nobility of Bohemia, 
which was mostly Protestant, and forcibly re-Catholicized the country by promoting Catholics, the nobility. I think they destroyed a bunch of Protestant churches, but Bohemia went from being a primarily Protestant country to being predominantly Catholic. He also was punishing other people who had sided with uh, with uh, Frederick during this, and that gives us the uh, Protestant Union. So at this time period, there was an alliance of the various Protestant princes uh, called the Protestant Union that was... Uh, that gave its support to Bohemia, and a number of them kept fighting in the aftermath of Bohemia. So Ferdinand was crushing them one by one and revoking titles or forcibly converting them back to being Catholic. He also felt strong in a strong enough position after defeating the Protestants to pass the Edict of Restoration. Sorry, Edict of Restitution. I should also add that there were some other minor wars. Denmark intervened and got defeated. And there was the Peasants' War, where there were mass peasant uprisings. And then there was also Transylvania invaded Hungary. A lot of minor conflicts happened. And after the emperor crushed them all, revoked a bunch of territory, imposed Catholicism on a bunch of different states, he passed the Edict. Now, the Edict of Restitution... Okay, so part of the Peace of Augsburg, which stated... Okay, so one of the main... Sorry if I'm having to go back a lot. This stuff's very complicated. So one of the main causes of the Reformation is the German princes wanted to grab church lands. So during the Reformation, they grabbed a whole bunch. And part of the Peace of Augsburg was, okay, they could keep whatever lands they had grabbed, but they couldn't grab any more land. Now, they had taken a lot of uh, land in the meantime, and Ferdinand passed the Edict of Restitution that... So yeah, so they had been seizing land in the meantime, and the Edict of Restitution basically reinforced the boundaries that had been declared at the Peace of Augsburg, because the Protestants had agreed there to not take more church land, but they went ahead and did it anyways. So Ferdinand started seizing all the church land from the past period of time, some of which, of course, had been legally purchased, but it was, it was forcibly taken back and re-given to the church. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this was the church was given so much land, they didn't have administrators for a lot of it. And during the Thirty Years' War, the Pope was largely on the anti-Habsburg side. So you have this scenario where you have this very devout emperor who's trying to reimpose Catholicism over the rest of the empire, who's given the church an immense amount of territory back, but the Pope is against him. So as the Edict of Restitution... Uh, was passed. This saw the emergence of France and Sweden, as the Protestant states that were still in revolt asked the King of Sweden, probably the most powerful Protestant ruler at the time, to come in and save them. Now, the Swedes had their own political uh, concerns at the moment. They wanted to form a, a North Sea Empire that would include the Baltic states, parts of Russia, and the northern parts of Germany. And they viewed this as a good excuse to come in with local support and basically do whatever it was that they were planning to do anyways. And this kind of brings us to the factions in the uh, Thirty Years' War. So roughly speaking, I think there was five. There was the emperor and his supporters. There was the Catholic League who were Catholics who were pro-constitution. So they were pro-Catholicism, but anti-imperial power. So they would continually, if the emperor was winning, they would snake on him. If he was losing, then they'd support him. Then you had France, who supported the Catholic League and the Protestants and Sweden. Then you had Sweden, who was against the Catholic League and the emperor. Then you had the Protestants, who were allied with France and Sweden, and then you had a whole bunch of just random minor players who were trying to grab as much as possible, not the least the, the, the main military leaders, uh, men like Wallenstein, who was theoretically part of the Emperor's Party, but might have tried to make himself King of Bohemia. We don't really know. So Sweden entered in, and they were led by Gustavus Adolphus who completely revolutionized warfare. No one really expected Sweden to do much in the war. But here we can see the advancement. Sweden made it all the way down, and I believe they sacked Munich. 
Like, look how far that is that they went. Uh, Sweden meant all the way through that, and they just sacked and destroyed things. See, this was during a time period, and we'll get into mercenary armies in, in a minute, when soldiers weren't really paid. They were paid largely in plunder. And this was not Sweden's land, so they had really no incentive to not rape and pillage everything. So you had Sweden that was running across the countryside. You had Protestant countries who were running across the countryside. Uh, France decided to get in at this point on the side of the Protestants because France was theoretically Catholic, but this was their best chance to curtail Habsburg supremacy. This was their best chance to bring down at least one of the antagonists on their borders, be it Spain or Austria or um, whoever. And the Pope kind of depended on what year it was. But the, yeah, so you had the, the Swedish, the um, uh, French and the Protestant League on one side. Now, France was not directly involved in the war until I think later, as they were mainly fighting in Spain, but they provided subsidies and diplomatic support. They also supported the Catholic League periodically, who was openly fighting against Sweden and the Protestants. Once again, does this sound confusing enough for you? And to a certain extent, this is why the whole thing went on for 30 years, is people kept switching sides. Uh, basically, one of the reasons that peace wasn't signed earlier is there were other peace treaties like the Peace of Prague and some other ones, but the balance of power was so close that a victory in the field would dramatically change the terms offered. So any time a party thought that there was some chance that they would be able to get an advantage, they would delay the peace talks. And as time went on, you get into the sunk cost fallacy, wherein the emperor didn't want to give up without centralizing power because it had been such an immense sacrifice. And he had basically gotten all the concessions he would have wanted with the Edict of Restitution and the Peace of Prague. The French didn't want to leave the war until they got their uh, accomplishments. Generally speaking, France's geopolitical ambitions on the continent uh, during this time period was, was to try to get defensible borders. So that was trying to secure uh, the left bank of the west bank of the Rhine, the mountain passes into Spain and Italy, it basically just take strongholds so that they could, so that what wouldn't happen again, what happened during Charles V's time where he just kind of repeatedly marched into France. They kind of wanted to uh, fix things there. So they, they weren't going to leave until they got their natural borders or however it was. Sweden had no real uh, desire to leave because they were having fun just looting and pillaging everything. And the Protestants were afraid that uh, the emperor would understandably kill them all and revoke all their land for rebelling against him. So no one really wanted to surrender. And within that, that, that context, we have the military situation. Now, the military situation is one of the most insane things I've ever heard of in my life. So this was post-feudal era and pre-modern era, so or early modern era. So we didn't have standing armies like we do in the modern era or conscription like we do, and we don't have feudal levies anymore. So governments were basically 100% reliant on mercenaries. And so you had huge mercenary armies under Wallenstein for the emperor and the Catholics. And then the, I think the Swedish army, the nucleus of it were direct, were Swedish mercenaries. But as they went along, all the armies were constantly recruiting, sometimes forcibly from the various villages they passed. And these armies were huge. At one point, one of Wallenstein's armies was like 120,000 people. And this is 120,000 people in the 17th century, all in one spot. It wasn't really possible to buy enough food to feed them all. So what the armies did was they just sacked everything. Um, they just looted everything as they went across it. Uh, if they came to cross fields or a farming town, they'd like burn it down and grab everything from it. That kind of thing. 
There was no money to pay basically anybody. So no one was getting paid. The mercenaries were just getting paid whatever it was they could steal. And sometimes if, and there was very frequently, most of them were not ideologically motivated. They were just trying to get money. So they would switch sides. So you'd have generals and whole armies that would switch sides part of the way through whoever offered them more money or whoever could provide them with supplies. And this constantly happened throughout the war. Now, obviously, this can't go on forever, although they made a pretty good effort at it. So the longer this went on, the more peasants died or were dislocated. Uh, the harvest got worse and worse and worse. And you had a famine settle in pretty much everywhere uh, within Germany. And then we get this kind of bizarre scenario in which the armies, because they were so large and there were so little supplies... Their movements were not based on anything strategic or tactical. It was solely based on where the supply lines would held out for. So you might have, that by this time period, the Swedish army was in West Germany. So you might have to move from there to there because uh, there was food there. But the Imperial army would be like here and they wouldn't be able to attack the Imperial army because there wasn't enough food. And this is basically what would happen for like the last decade or so of the war and it just kept like going on and on and sometimes one side would win and sometimes the other side would win but like i said it was really going nowhere now i've seen different estimates for what percentage of germany's population died during this I've seen estimates rate ranging from like 30 to 60 percent. It's very hard to tell because a lot of the supposed casualties among the civilian population during wars are people who ran away. So what they will sometimes do is they'll say, oh, the population of Hamburg declined by like 60 percent and it was sacked during the war. But that doesn't mean that 60 percent were killed. It means that 60 percent aren't in the city anymore. So a lot of them might have fled to other cities or gone to the countryside, or may not have come back for a while. So it's really hard, but there was mass famine, mass death. It was just truly horrendous. And then ultimately, it brings us to the peace of Westphalia. And I think a lot of modern secularism comes from the Thirty Years' War and the Reformation. Because people were so tired of the constant warfare, the constant killing of people over religion, that sort of thing. Religion was more seen as being a private matter after this and not something that should dictate uh, religious or rather should not determine secular geopolitics. And of course, that brings us to the question of who won the war. To a certain extent, that's like asking who won World War I. In which case, there was theoretically a side that won that you could put in a history book. But basically, everybody lost. Some people lost more than others. I'd say the Protestants probably lost the most, the German Protestants, because their lands got completely devastated and they were unable to really achieve any of their uh, major objectives beyond religious toleration at the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, Sweden, I suppose you could say, won as it got a bunch of new land in... Uh, northern Germany, but it was also bankrupt and had suffered immense casualties for such a small country. The Habsburgs survived, and I think you could consider that to be something of a victory, that they somehow came out of this in relative one piece, even if it, I think, was kind of the death of the attempts by the emperors to be able to forge the Holy Roman Empire into a German nation-state. The big winner, though, I'd say is France. Now, France spent a lot of money subsidizing the Protestants, but they weren't really militarily involved for a lot of the war. So they ran up huge debts, but you didn't really have their country being devastated in the same way Germany was. Um, they ran out of they they like I said, they suffered economically, but basically all of Germany had been completely and totally raped for the last 30 years. France made substantial territorial gains as a result of this. And more importantly, its relative power position was a lot better. Uh, sure, it was it was kind of bankrupt, but Germany was a mess. Spain was a mess, and the Netherlands was had broken somewhat away from uh, imperial 
uh, sphere of influence at this point. So I think you could say France is the big winner. You could also maybe say England is the big winner because England opted to stay out of this war. Now, I think England had some like drama that was going on there with, uh, I don't know, one of the many civil wars and coups and stuff that happened to England during the 17th and 16th centuries. But they didn't participate in it. Um, I think it was, I forget if it was Charles or James. They're one of the kings of England. They The, the Protestants were really upset because they thought he would support them. And he's like, no, I'm not getting involved in this clusterfuck. I don't want to get involved with this. You guys can just do whatever it is you want. And to a certain extent, Holland also took that perspective where they're like, look, we don't want to get involved with this nonsense. Just do whatever it is you want. We'll, we'll, I don't know, we'll, we'll figure this stuff out later. And so Prussia also, I think, emerged shortly after this. Let me see when the Kingdom of Prussia was founded. Kingdom Prussia. Or would it be the Duchy of Prussia? Um, yeah, Prussia was founded not too long after this from the remnants of the, uh, the Elector of Brandenburg, uh, so which came out of this war. But yeah, once again, it didn't really resolve any of the ongoing issues. It somewhat resolved the religion question as it was just not the same political force that it used to be. That's not to say people became less religious. Uh, it's just people were tired of it. In fact, one of the least religious places on earth is Bohemia, which is kind of understandable considering how many religious related genocides that country has had over the years. But Sweden still held parts of northern Germany and still was rather ambitious. Uh, Brandenburg emerged from the ashes of this as Prussia, and you began to have a diarchy within the Holy Roman Empire of the large Protestant kingdom and the large Catholic kingdom. France still wanted to become the dominant power, and England adopted its policy of allying with the second strongest power on the continent to, to prevent anyone from gaining a dominion over it. So sorry that was really long and confusing and I probably messed some stuff out, but that was my attempt to cover the 30 Years War in one video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I don't do these videos too often because they take so much time. Because I read like a full book. Actually, I read two books. I read a biography of Charles V. Then I read a book about the Thirty Years' War. So hope you enjoyed it. God bless. And I'll talk to you guys later.